For the fourth time in a hundred years, we're once again facing the incommunicable experiences of war. Man, we really can't ever get along now, can we? In 1939, Confederate President Jake Featherston had been elected again for a second term, the only Confederate president to get another six years in office. However, this was largely for show and only possible due to the way under his previous term he consolidated power and changed the Constitution which effectively made him president for life. With the conflict brewing in Europe, many knew it was inevitable that fighting would begin again between the Confederacy and their eternal rival, the United States of America. My great-grandfather fought the Yankees. My grandfather fought the damn Yankees. My father fought the goddamn Yankees. It's my turn now, and I don't know what Yankee I'll be fighting myself. Terry Beauregard. By the summer of 1941, he was ready for war against the United States and brought the Second Great War and the Fourth War between the states to the American continent. Okay, that's enough Ken Burns for one day. By the way, his entire Civil War documentary series is on Netflix, and you should watch it because it's one of the best documentaries ever. But seriously though, imagine living in this timeline. You might see a documentary exactly like this. Amazing to imagine the possibilities of alternate history. Which is why Alternate History Hub and I are making our videos over the Harry Turtle Dove Southern Victory series. Again, this is not spoilers for the main characters and their developments, but the general lore of the alternate history itself. The changes in the map, the different wars, the influence they'd have on future alternate generations. So as the beginning of this video pointed out, as well as at the end of part three, World War II, I mean, the Second Great War, has started. Europe is fighting again, and the Confederacy brings the war to the Americas through their invasion of Ohio, codenamed Operation Blackbeard. Get it? Because Barbarossa is a pirate, and so is Blackbeard? <laughs> Anywho, now they're driving their way through Ohio to cut America off. Their hope is by cutting off supplies from the two halves of the country, as well as their mighty display of military might, they would shock the United States and cause it to collapse or surrender or something. But, surprise surprise, the U.S. doesn't give up, so what now? Well, General Patton, who's leading Confederate forces, decides to focus on the city of Pittsburgh. It's a good checkpoint on the map and an industrial center. So they try to besiege the city, but the U.S. Army manages to prevent that, so it becomes a bitterly fought battle, street by street. Some of you may be asking, does this make Pittsburgh Stalingrad? Yes. Yes, it does. There are several parallels to our timeline's World War II. Like, who's Patton's rival general? Irving Morell. Don't see it yet? Let me switch some letters around a bit, uh, and, uh, change a few of them. <gasps> Old man Rama! And I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you pesky historians! Okay, so there are several things like that, and while some might find it unoriginal, I actually enjoy it. I see them as wonderful easter eggs inside the series. Besides, some things still go differently. It's not like the other side isn't still the Allies, it's old-fashioned World War I imperialism. Just with better weapons! Wait a minute. None of this involves Japan, does it? What's Japan doing? Well, in case you didn't know, since the US never took the Philippines, Japan did. Also, they somehow acquired French Indochina and the Dutch East Indies in the 1920s. The book didn't explain it that well. It kind of implied intimidation and compensation, but you know, it's not a main part of the story, so it doesn't matter. But the whole point is, they're bigger. So despite this, the United States, and presumably Germany, in the Pacific could cause problems for their expansion. So like in World War I, Japan is still on the side of the Allies. They're having naval battles with the US near Hawaii, and actually capture Midway Island. Then they lose it, and they never really take Hawaii. And that's about it for a while, but we'll get back to them later. What about Europe? Well, the British took over Ireland, Russia invaded Ukraine, which is a German puppet state essentially, and a massive Allied offensive invades the Low Countries and the Rhineland. Belgium is liberated from being a puppet state, and the Netherlands are actually a central power, so they get overrun too. Germany manages to hold them off at the Rhine River and outside of Hamburg. Then it's a stalemate again. Britain at one point tries to do a stupid thing and take resources from Norway so Germany doesn't get them, but that only causes Norway to join the central powers. Oops. Anything else important happen? Oh yeah, the British and Confederates drove the US out of the Bahamas and Bermuda, and Utah rebels again, and uh... 
Yeah, there is another thing too. Remember how Featherston was angry at the African Americans who rebelled during the Great War? Well, being a Nazi and all, he began sending them to death camps. An important part of this book series involves several black partisan groups trying to resist being captured and taken to the camps, as well as the Confederacy trying hard to make sure that no American army manages to find a camp. The British find out and they're a bit disturbed, but they need the CSA to keep the USA distracted so they just awkwardly shut up and pretend not to notice. It's a very dark and sad thing, but it's possible as the same thing happened in our timelines World War II. Hitler at several times pressured his allies to hand over their Jewish populations and sadly they mostly shut up and complied. The idea of a holocaust happening in America is startling, but we have to remember that if it can happen in one continent, it could happen in another. So, what's the turning point of the war? Well, the Confederates failed to take Pittsburgh, and some forces inside a Pittsburgh pocket surrender in 1943. The U.S. also begins to advance in various places along the border. How does the Confederacy keep supplying troops? Well, their ally, the Mexican Empire, is intimidated into sending reinforcements to help with that. Despite this, the U.S. manages to drive the Confederates back across the border and begin an offensive into Kentucky and Tennessee. They tried to invade Virginia to take Richmond, but that failed. Morrell decided to try the same strategy Featherston had, cut them in half, and maybe this time it'd work. By 1943, Utah's rebellion had failed, and there were more advances in Texas. The U.S. also decided to invade Mexican-held Baja California. Since it was cut off, it'd be easy pickings, and that was taken really quickly. Then also in 1943, the ultimate anime betrayal happened. With the war against the U.S. being a stalemate, which meant the U.S. wasn't going to be a threat to Japanese interests anymore, Japan ultimately decides to switch sides and attack British colonies in the area, taking British Malaysia and preparing for a possible invasion of Burma and India. The U.S. is fine with this, as they wanted to focus their full might on the South. Say, doesn't World War II involve nukes? Yes it does, except in this timeline they're called super bombs, and actually that's kind of a cooler name. Naturally, everyone is scrambling to get them as quickly as possible. The real question is, who gets them first? Well, with Germany never going Nazi, they kept a lot of notable Jewish scientists, like Albert Einstein. So they had quite the head start. They got their nukes first, and in 1944, decided to use them. They gave an ultimatum for Russia to make an armistice or else. Russia said no. So the Germans nuked Petrograd. The Tsar wasn't in there, so he didn't die, but he begrudgingly still refused to surrender. So Germany decided to try the other side, and gave the same ultimatum to France. They said no. Paris got nuked, and this time the French king was there, so France quickly capitulated as they had no backup leader, and frankly, they were tired of fighting. Seeing their other ally out of the war, Russia finally asked for an armistice, realizing they had no hopes of winning the war anyway. Plus, it seemed like Japan was also going to invade Russia and like try to take Siberia or something, so they had other problems. The next nation to develop an atomic bomb was actually the Confederacy, but it wasn't as powerful as they kind of rushed. They were super worried the US would make a bomb first, so they used their rushed bomb on Philadelphia. It did cause a lot of damage, but didn't destroy the entire city. Still, the U.S. was angry and sped up their own nuclear efforts. They also had finally advanced closer to Richmond, so Featherston had to begin fleeing south. The U.S. was third and nuked Newport News, Virginia. Why? They had intelligence Featherston was there, but he had already left. Guys, nukes aren't toys! Then, after Germany nuked Paris, the U.S. nuked Charleston, as it was the city with Fort Sumter, the area that started all this fighting all the way back in 1861. Meanwhile, Winston Churchill remained in Britain. He didn't give up. He said he'd fight on the beaches, he'd fight on the landing grounds, and he decided to nuke Hamburg. So how did Germany respond to the nuking of Hamburg? They retaliated threefold by superbombing Norwich, Brighton, and London. This was a problem because even though Winston Churchill had escaped London as well as the royal family, Britain didn't have as many bombs as Germany did apparently. Germany in fact even warned them that they had more bombs and were willing to use them if they didn't surrender. Churchill still didn't give up and tried to send another bomb, which was shot down over Belgium before it could get anywhere. Oops. With no options left, Churchill was ousted by what was left of the British government and the British requested for an armistice. Japan was a non-threat for the Central Powers, so that meant the Confederates were the last one left. So yeah, everyone's nuking everyone, except Japan. General Morrell had captured Atlanta and was moving through Georgia, similar to the March to the Sea that never happened in this timeline. 
Featherston refused to surrender and thought he could fight guerrilla style in the deeper south. But with the U.S. controlling large parts of Georgia now, he'd have to be careful. He tried to fly over with a plane, but he was caught and shot down. He tried to escape, but was found by some African-American partisans. They naturally shot him several times and killed him. With his death, several notable CSA officials also surrendered. Texas decided to secede from the CSA to become the Republic of Texas, and as a gesture of goodwill, arrested notable CSA figures in the area, including those who ran the death camps there, which were discovered by this point. They handed them over in a please don't hurt us, we're not with them gesture. The U.S. said, that works for us, figuring it just gave them less land to occupy, and decided to allow it. The rest of the CSA, though, was captured and surrendered under U.S. military occupation. With the final CSA leader surrendering on July 14, 1944, the CSA, after 83 years, was no more. Then that's it. That's where the story ends. The U.S. now possesses the former CSA, except for Texas, although they did recreate the state of Houston, and also annexed Baja California from Mexico. The book didn't say what the map looked like in Europe or the Pacific, as it wasn't ever the main focus, but a fun sideshow. With the end of the series, it makes you wonder several things. How would the U.S. heal? The CSA in our timeline ended in 1865, and there are still people out there resentful of it. This timeline one can only imagine it'd be at least a hundred times more prevalent. Would the US always keep control of Canada? Will they enter a cold war with Germany or Japan or both? Sadly, the books don't say. But the fun of alternate history is that you can come up with your own scenario for this. By the way, there's going to be another part. In case you newcomers to this channel had no idea, I love maps, especially animated ones. So I'm going to make a part 5 of this series that shows an animated map of everything that happened during the books from 1861 all the way to 1944. So if you enjoy maps, be sure to tune in to part 5. Thanks again to Cody for this wonderful collaboration and thank you all for watching. Please like and subscribe to this channel and Alternate History Hub and I will see you next time.